Namaste, good morning. Today we are going to talk about Peria and other Adavus, but you must be surprised as to why we are talking about these Adavus because as you have already learnt in first year. Actually, we are taking these Adavus and I am trying to show you the how these Adavus are being treated as far as space and time is concerned. So, we will look into from this point of view. The sequence is of 8 even counts and is articulated through the syllabus ta tai tai tat, dit tai tai tat, where one syllable is uttered for each count. It is characterized by rotatory arm movement synchronized with a linear body path. This Adavu is performed at a uniform pace. It begins with a jump straight up with the feet together. The body movement then continues to a single side in a linear fashion. Care is taken not to show the profile. The movement of the hands are continuous. They are thrown up vertically then separated on the either side to complete a circular motion before ending back at the original chest position. Though most of the Adavu is predictable, the jump at the beginning provides a dramatic entry. The constant movement and stretched far reaching position of the arms add to the impressive nature of this sequence. Except for the jump at the beginning, the center is consciously retained through the Adavu, thus sustaining the continuity of the circular definition of space by the arms. The mandala exerted by the body is explicitly defined by the rotation of the arms and is given prime focus while the linear axis remain secondary. The vertical axis stays centered almost throughout the sequence except during the 7th and the 6th count when the body angles in front to complete the circle. Even then the vertical axis tends to remain primary due to the sustained erect posture of the lower limbs. The additional axis created by the forward bend human body however emphasizes the three dimensional nature of the circle being defined. The geometries evoked in this Adavu are primarily circular and triangular. While the circular movement is predominant, its geometry is gradually evolved step by step. Thus, the complete geometry is perceived but never actually seen at a single moment. However, at every count, the body forms a vertical symmetrical composition with the lower limbs forming a robust and the upper body and arms forming a triangle. The rhombus formed remains constant through the sequence with the triangle redefining itself at every count. This composition emphasizes the core and periphery of the mandala and its awareness adds an additional layer to the space. The path of body movement is uniformly linear and negatively gently forward moving. The only incongruence being the vertical jump at the beginning. The movement is also rhythmically regular using fast in nature to accentuate the defined circular volume. It is thus a clean movement that polarizes a neatly defined area. 
the emphasis at the beginning marks the threshold into the primary cervical volume which moves while being created. I hope you understand. In this Adavu, due to the dramatic and constant motion and the predictability of the completion of the circle, the eye and head movement do not contribute aggressively to the general body movement. It is interesting to note that the direction of the head is opposed to the movement of the body but due to the symmetric circular motion of the arms, this contrary notion is neutralized. In fact, it provides a more balanced movement. The direction of the head and gaze of the eye are synchronic and follow the tip of the hands. That is on the, oppos on the side opposite the direction of body movement. As the gaze ends at the fingertips, a larger domain is not implied. While the relatively self-contained Katakamukha mudra is used to begin and end the Adavu, the mudra used through the movement as Alapadma in which the fingers are spread outward at a maximum possible distance from each other and articulated with a rotary motion. This mudra seems to reach outwards as far as possible from the body and its inherent nature complements the rotary motion of the arms and emphasizes the definition of body's mandala which is what this sequence crystallizes. This adavu is performed with the body path movement in a shallow U. This further emphasizes the tabular nature of a linear moving spherical definition. The adavu infuses a sense of completeness and uniformity through a passage of time providing a wholesome experience that touches every extremity but completes where it begins at the center. Sequence 2 Tat Tai Ta This sequence involves 8 moves but with differing time durations. The first two moves have a quicker count and steps 3 to 7 follow double the time. The last pose is held for four times the original count. To simplify this rhythm, this sequence is broken into 16 counts with steps 1 and 2 following a single count, steps 3, 7 following two counts each and step 8 is held in position for four counts totally 16 counts in a single side sequence. The Adavu is articulated by the syllabus Tat Tai Tam, Dit Tai Tam. This is repeated twice for each sequence. With the Tam syllable being held for two counts, this totals the 16 counts required for this sequence. This Adavu is characterized by a repeated emphasis on the body's position and centrality which is followed by a dramatic sideway movement that ends with a leap. The sequence is clearly broken into two distinct phases. The sequence begins with a strong body shift to the side that is step 1 and 2. This position and the initial direction suggested is emphasized by stretching out both arms and a leg in the same direction that is step 3. The leg is brought back into Araimandi position while the hands are held out again emphasizing this basic central position that is step 4. The legs are then brought in with a short but vigorous jump landing on the toes, further accentuating the sense of a core position already created that is step 5. 
This repeated emphasis marks the first phase of the Adavu which seems to portray strong stability at a point after the intended direction of the body has been clearly defined. The second phase immediately propels the whole body into a dynamic linear movement in the sideways direction originally hinted. An upper and lower limb is stretched out along with a tilt of the torso in the direction of movement thereby shifting the body axis as well. The other leg then joins the first one lifting the body into a near standing position while the other hand is stretched back in the opposite direction. This backward move balances the next movement which is a grand jump in the original direction with the outstretched arm circling over the torso emphasizing the dramatic leap. This is the climax of the sequence and the body movement finishes at an axis towards the direction of movement. This Adavu portrays a strong grounded emphasis of central position before moving linearly sideways in a focused path that culminates with a grand powerful leap. There exists a strong sense of centrality in the first phase. However, after this consolidation, it is more of a directional flight. The center moves upward in readiness for the leap after which the body immediately stabilizes and ends back in a tilted but firmly centered posture. The sense of center is retained almost throughout because of the near constant Araimandi posture and the single point consolidated emphasis of a centrality in terms of plan as well during the first phase of movement. The movement is decidedly linear towards the side. This path seems straight, studies and true. The first phase seems simply to be indicating the direction and instantly marking the start point of the actual movement. The second phase is where the decided movement to the side is followed with a flight jump in the same direction. This part has three steps which are essentially intense postures in themselves. While the first is a step in the direction of the movement, the second pulls the body sidewards and balances it by pulling the center up that is standing and stretching the opposite hand in a backward direction. This balance felicitates the strong climatic leap that ends the sequence. The central vertical axis of the body is retained through the first phase. However, in the second phase, the linear movement is emphasized by an angled tilt towards the direction of movement. The tilted axis is offered as a clue in the first pose and then brought back to the vertical stability as the body balances before the movement of flight through which the body again tilts the axis to highlight the motion. The geometries evoked through this sequence are more linear than actual shapes or patterns due to the strong definition of the center followed by clean linear movement the emphasis remains on the straight line of motion am i clear the exploration of space within the mandala is alternately curvilinear and linear in a symmetric fashion in the first phase the center is emphasized with a rounded movement 
the direction of the head and the gaze is forward, again focusing the central convergence of energy, except in step third, when the head turns to the side along with the opening of an outstretched arm as an indication to the movement to happen in that direction. This seems simply a fleeting clue before the body continues its insistence on the strength of that point. The mudras used are Shikara and Pataka and Alapadma and Katakamukha. The Shikara gesture and Alapadmakaha gestures are used to emphasize the arched movements while Pataka and Katakamukha stabilize and perform as endpoints. In the second phase too, Alapadma and Shikara are used for directional emphasis. The mudras are used in pairs. Shikara is stabilized with Pataka in the first four steps. Alapadma and Katakamukha are used in steps 5, 6 and 7. The sequence ends back with Shikara, emphasizing the jump and the tilt in the axis while the Pataka Mudra stabilizes and contains the movement. The gaze follows the fingertips in the direction of movement, even looking backwards along with the upper body in step 7. Step 8 ends with the gaze a little ahead of the fingertip, further lengthening the jump and the space covered in reality. This Adavu is clearly a sequence of studied static poses that successively flow into the next in a smooth dynamic fashion, thus managing to simultaneously signify stability and flight. The path begins with a strongly defined start point that includes a hint to the future direction. It then smoothly moves forward with well thought pause points that are dynamic yet balanced. The sequence ends with a dramatic climax as the body leaps forward with certainty. The final posture provides stability and contained dynamic energy yet seemingly looking forward in a light illusion to the unending cyclic nature of life. Sequence 3 Natta Adavu This sequence is essentially a series of four poses that is equally spread over eight counts. It is an exploration of the mandala though consciously retaining a constant body center. The Adavu is articulated through the syllabus Tai Yum Ta Tat Tai Yum Ta Ha with a constant count. The static poses of this Adavu explores the extreme diagonals of the three dimensional mandala of energy that surrounds the body. The body center is religiously maintained, thus holding the boundary of the mandala, also constant through the sequence. The series of postures constantly shift the direction and axis of the body while maintaining the center. The last position brings the body back to the Vaishnava sthana, the stable Aramandi posture. The final of symmetry and stability, each pose is arrived at in the first count and accentuated by a heavy stamp of the stable foot as the pose is continued through the following count. <clears throat> the four poses are thus spread over the eight counts. When this sequence is repeated on the left and right sides, the body traces both sideways diagonals completely as well as the frontal lower one. 
In the first pose, the body is tilted down sideways with a leg on that side and both arms stretched out to trace one of the diagonals, the torso being perpendicular to the clear diagonal axis created by the outstretched arms and leg. The torso is then lifted back to an erect position and the body is turned in the opposite direction while maintaining the leg and arm position in the second pose. This sustains the diagonal axis but brings back the straight vertical axis though it still is secondary to the diagonal one maintained by the limbs. The third posture explores the lower front diagonal. Here the hands and leg are first brought back together and then immediately extended forward. The torso also leans forward to reach the lowest point. The axis now completely shifts to a vertical one with a secondary horizontal axis running through the center from front to back. This horizontal axis is created by the near horizontal position of the upper torso when the hands are stretched down at the front. The last pose brings all the limbs back towards the body center. The torso is erect. The entire posture returns to the simple Aramandi position that is the Vaishnava Sthana. The motion in this sequence is relatively slow and studies. Though primarily a series of poses, the posture themselves, especially the first two are dramatic and highly dynamic. The mudras used are again Alapadma and Katakamukha. The arm movements are alternately celebrated rotatory movements and simple straight ones that bring the hands back to home position in front of the chest. These indicate an elaborate opening and an eloquent closing sequentially. The gaze follows the hand movement in the direction the body is oriented. This contributes strongly to further emphasize the directional changes. In this case, the axis shifts and lines thus created are the most important geometries. However, when both side moves are viewed as a whole, a clear triangular area emerges within the mandala. <coughs> the geometric symmetry and exploration in this Adavu are highly commandable and its composition simple yet pleasing. The Adavu constantly shifts the angle of perspective and direction of gaze of the artist, yet a fine balance, focus and harmony is maintained. Inferences In all cases, the basic principles of a space were strictly and clearly followed. First, the maintenance of a focused center. Second, though dynamic in nature, a simple balance was always achieved. Third, the symmetry and geometries involved were well studied and developed. Fourth, the beginning of a path was always clearly defined and articulated. Fifth, every minute, every minute part of the body was considered and conditioned to contribute to the entire movement. It is thus obvious that dance incorporates a clear and constant theory of space making that involves all the principles the theorists on such issues have always polemized. However, the process which dance follows to create this is highly more experiential in quality. In dance, 
the body alters the space as an intuitive need for change that contributes to the overall experience. A series of events that constitute a certain time frame. One can keep exploring the space with a number of emotional and physical innovations that further define the constant change of a medium's definitions. However, the basic patterns, root philosophy and ethos of the basic posture and movements types mostly remain as a sacred thread that holds all the innovations together and retaining an order in the change allows the space thus defined to remain true. This space has qualities that are rooted in the simplest of basics and thus seem to be the most effective. It is probably true quite generally that in the history of human thinking, the most fruitful developments frequently take place at those points where two lines of thought meet. These lines may have their roots in quite different parts of human culture, in different times or different cultural environments or different religious traditions. Hence, if they actually meet, that is, if they are at least so much related to each other that a real interaction can take place, then one may hope that new and interesting developments may follow. Werner Heisenberg The wisdom of the past was homogeneous and every arm of culture made use of the growth and understanding of human wisdom as a whole. Somewhere down the line, while attempting a process of purification in the pursuit of objective clinical understanding, we as scholars almost lost the advantages of unification and osmosis. There is much one can learn or unlearn by simply approaching a problem from a different perspective. Interdisciplinary studies allow one to develop a rounded knowledge and view concepts from different angles. It thus allows one to easily absorb already studies and proven relevant theories without having to invent them again. Such studies are of great benefit to all branches of intellectual study. All our senses are engaged by the act of making space. These ways are various. Are our ways as various? We have tried to evaluate the possibility of developing a theo theoretical framework for defining space that is based on the body and dance in particular. Bharatanatyam. The mo motive is to understand space from an alternative discipline. The formalized dance of Bharatanatyam and the universalized Adavus taught were chosen as movements that exemplified the essence of ancient learning. This analysis has proved unique opportunities to understand the concepts of space, its dimensions, definition techniques and malleable properties, dynamism, kinetics, body movement and hapticity. This fresh perceptive on concerns that are crucial to greatly increases one's awareness and sensibility, especially to such issues that require an experiential understanding more than simply an intellectual one. This approach clearly verifies that the interaction of architecture with dance involves issues of movement, geometry, the body and space. By studying this interaction, architects may find ways to define space and generate build form originating in movement. It is not likely that this approach will completely supplant already established 
approaches. Through the analysis, a clear premise of space definition in a discipline seldom acknowledged as embodying this emerges. The connotations of space making thus redefined allow a fresh understanding and approach to this primordial act. The patterns and path definitions throw interesting light on the morphological understanding of dance. The eternal debate on the center versus the periphery and the proximity and relationship between parts of a whole are all dealt with and provide fresh and interesting angles to ruminate upon. This study was never meant to end with concrete conclusions and direct patterns that one could transport straight into architecture. Though this is possible, it is also probable that this exercise would end up being too literal, highly subjective and not worthy of serious consideration. However, it was intended to shed light on simply a clearer and more experimental understanding of space and the possibilities of an interdisciplinary furthering of knowledge between dance and architecture. This I believe has been achieved. The qualities of space making and cone within the simple discipline of Bharatanatyam is highly commandable and rich in clarity. Based on the body and on movement is in its nascent stage to create environments for bodies that move displacing some of the contemporary obsession with formal concerns by introducing or reintroducing movement concerns and the centrality of the person or body in every defined space.